Hosea chapter 9, we'll take up our study in the book of Hosea. I tell you what, if we keep having these um, global warming episodes, we're going to wind up with an ice age. I can't remember the last time I played with snowballs in the spring in Texas. But I, as you probably well know, I love it. (laughs) I love it when conventional wisdom is shown to be foolish. I I think that is almost providential. uh, How how that, when when people that are wise in their own understanding, and they don't look to God for wisdom, and they have all these theories, and then they're blown out of the water by the process of time. Hosea chapter 9. Before we get started, would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Great God and Father, we thank you so very much for your beauty and power seen in nature. We're so thankful for the snow and the blessings that come with it. We pray, Father, that you will be with those who who are on the road traveling, especially those of the household of faith, that they might be safe from any harm and any danger. We pray, Father, that you will bless us as we seek to to do your will, that we will always fear you and love you and seek to be obedient to your commandments. As we study the prophets, Lord, help us to make practical application to our life, to our family, and to the church as a whole. Help us always as we strive to spread the gospel throughout this community and throughout the world. In all things, Holy Father, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Hosea chapter 9 and verse 1, we're continuing uh, God's um, condemnation of Israel in their wickedness. It says in verse 1, Rejoice not, O Israel, exalt not like the peoples. For you have played the whore, forsaking your God. You have loved a prostitute's wages on all threshing floors. Threshing floor and the wine vat shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail them. They shall not remain in the land of the Lord, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean, unclean food in Assyria. God is telling the people through Hosea, you don't exalt, you don't rejoice um, because you are not doing something that's for your benefit. You're not doing something that is good. Uh, You are playing the whore. You are forsaking your God. You find that thought throughout the prophets. Jeremiah chapter 3 is one chapter in which Uh, The prophet through Jeremiah talks about that and uses the language of how God was a husband to Israel, his bride, and that bride forsook him by going after other gods. And so uh, God here is repeating that. You find that message throughout the, the prophetic writings of the Old Testament. And it says, You have loved uh, the prostitutes' wages on all... Uh, threshing floors, Uh, nothing that was to be uh, involved in any kind of illegal activity as far as monetary gain was to go towards uh, the temple or go towards anything in Israel. That was part of the law of Moses. They were not to engage in illegal revenue. Anything that would, that's wicked, that would produce money was not to go towards the benefit of of the nation of Israel. And of course, we see that problem in our society today uh, of, of people wanting uh, legalized gambling, uh, some wanting legalized prostitution, and they say, well, it'll help our schools. It'll help, our, it'll help this. The money that we get from it will help that. It'll help improve. But it's corrupt. And really, when you study the, 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 the states that have legalized things like that, it does not help their schools. It does not go and help those situations. 
That's what they said about the lottery in Texas. It's going to help our schools. Well, when you look at it, it really hasn't. And so uh, nothing that produces money of a wicked nature should be used. And that's exactly what's going on in Israel. And he says in verse 3, They shall not remain in the land of the Lord. Well, what's the land of the Lord? The land of Israel, the, the promised land, right. The land of Canaan that, that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they went in and God, that God gave them when they went in through Joshua and conquered the land. That was the, the promised land, the land of the Lord. He says, you're not going to remain uh, in the land of the Lord, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt and they shall eat unclean, unclean food in Assyria. Returning to Egypt here... Uh, from what I've studied is, is probably um, a metaphor in the sense of they're going back into bondage because it was the Assyrian Empire that took Israel into captivity in 722 B.C. It wasn't Egypt. But Egypt symbolically represented slavery for God's people. It represented slavery and wickedness. It's, jo- it's just like in the book of Revelation where Babylon is used to represent Rome and the Roman Empire. Babylon, a wicked, pagan nation persecuting God's people of the Old Testament, was used symbolically in the, in the New Testament to represent the Roman Empire and the wickedness that they were doing against the church. So Egypt here is probably not being used literally because they did not go into Egyptian bondage. They went into Assyrian bondage. But it was used symbolically to refer to them going back into bondage. And what, what does it mean about the unclean food there in verse 3? Exactly. Uh, they, they were going to be forced to eat the, the unclean foods that the law of Moses forbid them to eat. Uh, you see that problem even with... Uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 1 in which they they made a contest out of it to see who would fare better. And the Lord blessed that situation and and caused them to have favor in the eyes of their officials. So um, they would go into these lands and they would have to eat the unclean food that was forbidden for them to eat. And a lot of that had to do with um, um, the, the dietary restrictions had to do with a lot of the the diseases that people could get. Uh, people uh, could uh, get all kind of uh, uh, parasites and such from meat, especially pork, that was not cooked properly. Uh, and, and so um, God forbade his people to eat that in the Old Testament. Uh, number one, because he said not to do it. It's unclean. Number two, because scientifically we know the problems of those foods. So they were now going to have to be eating that food. Verse 4. They shall not pour drink offerings of wine to the Lord, and their sacrifices shall not please Him. It shall be like mourner's bread to them. All who eat it shall be defiled. For their bread shall be for their hunger only. It shall not come to the house of the Lord. The offerings that they're making, verse 4 is saying, God is not going to be pleased with it. It goes back to what we looked at in the sermon uh, tonight about how uh, God is pleased with the sacrifice of the righteous, not with the the wicked. Uh, The wicked, the people living in sin, can worship all day long and they're wasting their time, basically, uh, unless they repent and come back to the Lord. And so it talks about mourner's bread there to them. Um, The sacrifices that they're offering is going to be like mourner's bread. There was a type of bread that was eaten during the time of mourning when they would mourn uh, perhaps the passing of a loved one. They would eat that type of bread. And he's saying, this is what your sacrifices are going to be like. Verse 5 and 6, what will you do on the day of the appointed festival, on the day of the feast of the Lord? For behold, They are going away from destruction, but Egypt shall gather them. Memphis shall bury them. Nettles shall possess their precious things of silver. 
thorns shall be in their tents. So they're still going through some festivals and such. He says Egypt and Memphis, of course, Memphis was uh, one of the cities in Egypt, and Netels was also another city, is going to possess you. And in other words, language of captivity. You're going into captivity. You're, you're not going to save yourself simply by going through sacrifices and festivals. And that's what he's talked about earlier in the, in the book, how that they're going through these motions and they're, they're, they're thinking that God is just going to accept them based upon the merits of going through the motions. And God is saying, no, you, you're wicked, you're, you're serving other gods. And uh, when you repent and you come back to me, then you can start sacrificing and, and come back to these festivals, festivals, and I will accept it. <clears throat> Verses 7 through 9. The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool, and the man of the spirit is mad because of your great iniquity and great hatred. The prophet is the watchman of Ephraim with my God, yet a fowler's snare is, all, is on all his ways, and hatred in the house of his God. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. Uh, he will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. So he's saying the punishment, the days of punishment have come. It's time for recompense. The prophet is a fool. The man of the, uh, of the spirit is mad because of your great iniquity and great hatred. Now, some have uh, thought that this is referring to perhaps the true prophet is viewed as a fool. The true prophet is viewed as a fool and, and someone who's uh, crazy. Uh, some have suggested this might be referring to the false prophet because it's just referring to a, a, fa- a prophet as a fool here. Uh, and it could be referring to someone that's false. The point is, they're rejecting God's will. They're rejecting His uh, will, and it's time for punishment to come upon them. Verse 9 says, They have deeply corrupted themselves, as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their iniquities. He will punish their sins. They have deeply corrupted themselves. And so the, the problem is with people uh, corrupting themselves and, and getting themselves deeper and deeper and deeper into corruption. And the Bible talks about how that there can be a time when a nation would not be uh, able to be redeemed or retrieved back. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, in talking about the Gentile nations, it says God gave them up. They, begot, they got so wicked, God gave them up, gave them over to their wickedness. Any questions or comments about this before we go any further? <clears throat> Verse 10 says, Like grapes in the wilderness I have found Israel, like the first fruit on the fig tree in its season I saw your fathers. But they came to Bel Peor and consecrated themselves to the thing of shame and became detestable like the thing they love. Ephraim's glory shall fly away like a bird, no birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Even if they bring up children, I will bereave them till none is left. Woe to them when I depart from them. Ephraim, as I have seen, was like a young palm planted in a meadow. But Ephraim must lead his children out to slaughter. Give them, O Lord, what you will give. Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Now notice what he says up here. He, he's talking about uh, Israel. He says in verse 10, Like grapes in the wilderness I found Israel, like the first fruit on the fig tree in its season, I saw your fathers. Now when it talks about fathers, it's talking about your ancestors. He, he saw them as, as something uh, that was valuable. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph, their descendants. But then it says... 
but they became Baal Peor. And that is referring to what you find in Numbers chapter 25. So if you want to hold your place here and go to Numbers chapter 25, you can see the, the reference that he's making and what it means they became Baal Peor. B-A-A-L is uh, Baal referring to one of the uh, Canaanite deities. Um, and it was one of the gods that the people... Um, had problems with, all the time tempted to worship, just like the nations round about them. Numbers chapter 25 and verse 1. While Israel lived in Shechem, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. You know how the Bible is just very straightforward. (laughs) It's just very plain spoken and just kind of tells it like it is. Here is Israel, they lived in Shechem, and they began to whore with the daughters of Moab. Verse 2, these invited the people to sacrifice to their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. That's what the whoring was about. Spiritual adultery that was going on. Verse 3, so Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor. Israel was there, they yoked themselves. What does it mean they yoked themselves? They crack eggs between them, or what's the deal here? They joined. They yoked. The New Testament says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't join yourself with unbelievers in in, in a partnership. Uh, And so there's that that yoking together and becoming like the, the people that are around about you. That's why it's dangerous when God's people, single, uh, uh, single people among the church, start dating the world. I've got a friend whose son is a member of the church. He, he was a faithful member of the church until he found a girlfriend in a denomination. Now, as a, fa- he, as a faithful member of the church, he, he tried to get her to go, but she wouldn't. But now he's going where she goes. It almost always winds up that way. Because you, you get sentimental, and you start thinking sentimentally with the person that you're with and you, you want to please them and then you uh, forsake the Lord and, and turn away from Him. And, and that's, that, that, that story can be repeated so many times. Here's Israel's problem. They began to uh, be like the people around about them. So they began to yoke themselves, verse 3, to Baal at Peor. That's why it says Israel became Baal Peor. They started yoking themselves to the people around about them. Verse 3 of Numbers 25. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people, hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. Then you learn about um, the zeal of Phinehas there in, in, in spearing some people in the very act of fornication. Uh, through the ground and so that's found there in verses uh, 10 um, through 13 so you you see uh, God's people there becoming Bel Peor and becoming like the wicked people uh, who are around about them and so that's what that reference is referring to you were, a, you were a fruitful people, you were a beneficial people, verse 10 of Hosea chapter 9, but you became Belpeor and consecrated yourself to the thing of shame and became detestable like the thing they loved. So you become detestable when you engage in wickedness, you become detestable to God. He still loves you, He wants you to come back. But what you're doing is an abomination. What you're doing is wickedness uh, in the sight of God. Verse 11, Ephraim's glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Do you notice the backward sequence here? Birth, pregnancy, conception. This is one of many places in the Bible 
where conception is the beginning, part of, beginning point of human life. Conception is when human life begins. You became a person at conception. And so there's conception, pregnancy, and birth. He's saying in the, pre, in the punishment I'm going to give them, their glory is going to fly away. There's going to be no birth, no pregnancy, no conception. So uh, the Bible, and of course medical science has confirmed what the Bible has said all along, when conception takes place, that's when a new human being comes into existence. Uh, anything that kills or destroys that is killing a human being. That's why embryonic stem cell research is wrong. It kills humans, human embryos. That's why it's unethical to do such. And uh, there's plenty of research saying that you can get stem cells, harvest stem cells from uh, other cells other than embryos. And so um, there's no need to do it. It's wrong. It's contrary to the will of God. And, of course, we don't have to even go into the concept of abortion. Uh, that's the taking of human life. Yes. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's a human being there. And, and from the moment of conception, it's a human being just going di- through different phases of life. And uh, the, the, that human developing in the womb is a distinct person from the mother. And in some cases can have even a different blood type than the mother. The only thing that's added after conception is oxygen and nutrients. That's it. That's all that's added after conception. So we see that plainly taught in the Bible. And um, under the law of Moses, if someone uh, fought and a woman that was pregnant got hurt and she accidentally miscarried, if the baby survived, he would receive a fine or a penalty. But if the baby died, the person who caused that should die. That's what the law of Moses said. Um, that should put some bearing on what God thinks about people who would kill innocent unborn children. And if this health bill goes through, I don't know the, what's going to happen with this, but I do know I've heard that if this health bill that's being voted on this very day gets passed with all of the bells and whistles in it, Abortions in this nation will increase at least by 30%. Tax funded. Verse 12. Even if they bring up children, I will bereave them till none is left. Woe to them when I depart from them. See, when God leaves, God never stays where He's not wanted. As, as always has been said about uh, God he is a, and Christ, He's a perfect gentleman. He will not stay where He's not wanted. And woe to them when I depart from them. That needs to be preached from Congress and from sea to shining sea in this nation. Woe to the United States of America when He departs from us. Ephraim is as if I had seen, uh, as I have seen, was like a young palm planted in a meadow. But Ephraim must lead his children out to slaughter. Give them, O Lord, what you what what will you give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breast. So it's going to result in they're not going to perpetuate themselves. They're going to go into bondage, and it's going to result in the end of them. Verses 15 through 17. <clears throat> Every evil of theirs is in Gilgal. There I began to hate them. I want you to notice the language here. This is God speaking through Hosea. Every evil of theirs is in Gilgal. There I began to hate them. 
because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. Verse 16, Ephraim is stricken, their root is dried up, they shall bear no fruit. Even though they give birth, I will put their beloved children to death. My God will reject them because they have not listened to Him. They shall be wanderers among the nations. So you see here in verse 15, That's where I began to hate them. And it talks about the evil that's in Gilgal. Every evil of theirs is in Gilgal. There I began to hate them. Because of their wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. How do you reconcile that with what John says? God is love. Right, right. I think what can be said of this, he, is, he hates what they have become. Can parents not love their children who have gone astray and at the same time hate what they have become? So you could say it's a, it's a love-hate relationship. You hate what they've become because you know it's detrimental to their well-being but you love them and you want them to come back. Right. He, he hates the sin, not the sinner, but he does say here in verse 15, I hate them, I will love them no more. Um, I'm not aware of any... I just, I just know that every, every thought of their heart was wicked. I don't know if the word hate is used. Um, in that passage. But God can hate what we, we become. I, I'm convinced that God, did, did not God love the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, sure. But did He not hate what they became so much so that He said, I'm going to wipe them out? I'm going to wipe them out. They're unredeemable. He told Abraham, what was the lowest number? Ten? If you can find ten good people in Sodom and Gomorrah, I'll spare the cities. They couldn't find ten. There's no telling how many thousands of people were in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God can love, in a, God loves in perfection, but He can hate in perfection too in a way that we don't love and hate um because he he has the the perfect balance so to speak he can love and hate at the same time and the bible says that we're to we're to love righteousness and hate wickedness and we are we're not in the business of hating people but we can hate what people become we can hate what uh they're doing to themselves and to those around them so as one preacher described it, he said that some sinners become so identified with their sin and so wicked that God hates what they have become. Now, can you say there's going to be love in hell? He's going to punish multitudes of people in hell for eternity. They're not going to get out. Right. He loved them. They spurned His love. They rejected His love. And now they're facing His wrath. And that's an unredeemable situation in hell. Once you cross over there, there's no coming out of it. And they, yes. 
The, the warning was there. So the, the love is there. The love is there initially. The love is there initially. He, God loves, um, uh, the Bible says in the Psalms, that children are a gift from the Lord. So the love is there initially. Children, offspring, are, uh, are a reward from the Lord. So the love is there initially. But when children grow up and they become wicked, they become sinful and they become so corrupt that they just don't care and it's going to cause them to be lost, they've rejected God's love. And as a result, verse 16 and 17 uh, becomes the, the thing. My God will reject them, verse 17, because they have not listened to Him, they shall be wanderers among the nations. They won't, they won't listen. And so um, that goes back to the whole concept that you find earlier. They, they've corrupted themselves. Uh, they have put themselves in this situation. And they have, uh, put their, they have this laid upon themselves the iniquity. And as a result of that, they, they have to face God's wrath. Any question or comment about uh, chapter 9 be, before we go any further? I didn't put my timer on like I should have. I don't know. I'm trying to figure out how much time I've gone. About 30 minutes, I think. Close to 30 minutes. So uh, I'll go. we'll go a little bit into chapter 10. And then we'll, uh, we'll close the class. Hosea 10 and verse 1, Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. The more his fruit increased, the more altars he built. As his country improved, he improved his pillars. Their heart is false. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their pillars. So it's a luxuriant vine, he says. It yields its fruit and it's increased and built altars and improved itself, but none of these things are things that are pleasing to God because what's false? Verse 2. Their heart. Their heart is false. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their pillars. Verses 3 through 6. For now they will say, We have no king, for we do not fear the Lord. And a king, what could he do for us? They utter mere words with empty oaths. They make covenants. So judgment springs up like poison weeds in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria tremble for the calf of Bethim. Its people mourn for it, and so do its idolatrous priests. Those who rejoice over it and over its glory, for it has departed from them. The thing itself shall be carried to Assyria as tribute to the great king. Ephraim shall be put to shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his idol. And see, So we see there the problem they have uh, with idolatry. They, they utter oaths, but they're mere words. Uh, they, their judgment springs up like poisonous weeds. It says there in verse 5, the inhabitants of um, Samaria tremble for the calf. And of course, the calf there is referring to the calf worship. The people mourn for it, and so do its idolatrous priest. Those who rejoice over it and over its glory, for it has departed from them. Because what is Assyria going to do? Assyria is going to come in and is going to take that golden calf that they fall down and worship, and they're going to take it back to Assyria. As part of the tribute, as part of something that they've conquested, that's what they did in uh, 606 to 586 BC when they when Judah fell and Jerusalem fell. What did they do? They went into Solomon's temple. They got all of all of the instruments that were used in the sacrificial system, and they took them back to Babylon. So here they're all upset over their calf their golden calf that they set up um, to worship. But this is part of the punishment that was going to come upon them for their idolatrous uh, activities. 
We'll stop right there, and we will continue our study of the book of Hosea uh, next week, Lord willing.